Okay, for people who are joining us, we are doing a working session about our physics project, well, at least nominally about our physics project. I myself am currently having a, a bit of a meta-mathematical crisis, so I wanted to talk to Jonathan about that. Actually, my, my crisis just came to a head because my giant collection of 150 processes that were running trying to compute something just crashed. And that is a sign of some uh, something that I profoundly don't understand. I mean, it's kind of like, like forget undecidability when the, when the thing that is trying to figure something out actually crashes, it's not clear what that means. Um, they probably found something interesting. That probably that's why it crashed. It's because, it, so I, I've been, um, uh, one thing I've been doing, for some reason, 1921 was an interesting year. And since it's 100 years after that, I figured let's try and finish a few things that got started in 1921. And so as Jonathan knows, I've been, I've been trying to nail down this thing that Emil Post looked at you know, the history of the whole Emil Post business in 1921 is quite interesting. I mean, he, you know, what he had done was he had taken Principia Mathematica, Whitehead and Russell, and he had said, I can simplify this. I can just turn it into string rewriting. And he got it to the point where he said, if only, you know, I've reduced all of Principia Mathematica to string rewriting. So now the only problem is to solve string rewriting. And he ended up with this one particular string rewriting problem that he just couldn't solve. And so I've been trying to solve that and my computer just crashed trying to solve an analog of that problem. So um, the uh, one of the things that is super mysterious there is that there are, there's the system that seems to always halt, but yet I'm convinced that it must be computation universal. And so I've been very confused about what it means to prove universality, to not prove universality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we were just talking about this morning was the possibility that, you know, where do you get the axioms for mathematics from anyway? And what if you just add the principle of computational equivalence as an axiom for the mathematics you're dealing with? What would that mean? Because that would immediately tell you that this thing, well, it would immediately suggest that this thing can't halt. I think, because as soon as you believe in, uh, as soon as you believe, okay, so here's another question. So one of the ideas of principle of computational equivalence is when systems are not obviously simple in their behavior, they must be capable of, of sophisticated and universal computation. How do you define obviously simple in their behavior? So one thing I was thinking about is, is there a, you know, is inability to prove halting in piano arithmetic is that a sign of uh, not being obviously simple, so to speak? In other words, if the proof of halting can be done within some axiom system, how does that relate to sort of what it means to be obviously simple in your behavior? So how would you characterize um, the, uh, um, uh, how do you characterize some, um, uh, you know, what is the relationship between provability in an axiomatic system and, for example, uh, uh, predictability? Because they're a little bit different. Provability of non-halting is, a, I think, a little different. Um, and uh, Jonathan, you having thoughts? Actually, we have an interesting question already from Sol. Sol underscore UK. How do you establish isomorphism in order to enable an axiomatic approach? Yeah, isomorphism is a is a big can of worms, um, and and possibly, uh, yeah. Jonathan, you're not saying anything, which makes me very nervous. What what? Um, uh, Sorry, you, you you were talking. Uh, what, what what am I what am I meant to say? What? You're you're meant to give me your brilliant insight into this question about uh, the relationship between provability in an axiom system and sort of obvious simplicity of behavior. Because I haven't really ever thought about that. I mean, in other words, things like, oh, it's obviously repetitive, it's obviously nested. How does that relate to it's obviously accessible to piano arithmetic because it can just deal with ordinary induction, for example? I, I think one is the inverse. I, I think they're not directly comparable because I think one is the inverse problem of the other. 
The problem of perception and analysis as addressed in NKS, I think is much closer to the problem of defining an axiom system, right? It's like, so, you know, similar to what happened in the, fin in the, um, in the foundations crisis of, of the 20th century, right? It's like you, you people already, mathematics already existed, theorems already existed. There was already complex stuff being proved. And what people were interested in was this question of well, what, what are the rules from which we can then build up those, those theorems in a kind of completely formal and rigorous way. But that's what folks like Zamilo, Frankel, Brouwer, et cetera, were kind of working on trying to solve. That seems much closer to the perception and analysis problem of you've got a system that's doing complicated stuff. Let me try and reverse engineer what rules that, that behavior can be built up from. Whereas what you're talking about is a, it seems to be to be a, a non-perception related predictability question, which is, you know, I know what the rules are, but can I obtain such and such a configuration? And that's, that's, which is effectively, you know, your, your provability within piano arithmetic story. And that's much closer to the question of given some scientific theory, uh, you know, is such and such a configuration uh, permissible within those, within those constraints. But that's a, that's a different well, way of making I mean, it seems like a different problem. The, the way I view the, the perception analysis thing, part of that is a computational reducibility story. That is, you have the system, you know it's underlying rules, but you ask yourself, what's it going to do? And if you can have a simple model for that system. You say, oh, it's just repetitive. Then you've got the problem solved. Right, no, That's no, I, I understand that. What, but I, what I'm saying is I think it's, I think it's worthwhile to, to break that apart into two separate things, right? There is the computational reducibility thing of given that I know the rules of the system, what's it gonna do, right? Mm -hmm. and, and as you say, you know, you, in fact, you need reducibility in order to be able to do that faster than the system itself evolves by definition. But there's also the inverse problem, which is I've got a system, it's doing some, you know, I'm looking at snowflakes, I'm looking at mollusk shells, I'm looking at the physical universe, whatever it is. And I want to work out what are the rules on which, you know, what, what, what are an effective set of rules from which I can build up this behavior. Um, that, you know, that, that in a sense is, is the general, seems to me to be the generalized, you know, perception and, and analysis problem. It is, but I think that's a little different, right? I mean, that, that's, that's the whole scientific induction question of your, I mean, okay, so you're saying, okay, I'm given I, I, a thing. I, yeah, I, I'm saying that, that what happened, as I say, in, in, during, the, during the foundations crisis that we are celebrating, you know, in a sense, the centennial of, uh, or part of the centennial of, um, what happened is, is closer to that scientific induction thing, right? It's like mathematics, there were already theorems that, that people knew to be true in the sense that, you know, mathematicians wanted theorems like, uh, you, know, the, 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 you know, the laws of integer arithmetic to be, to be correct the underlying rule set from which I can build up that behavior. Right, so That's you're saying that th this is the analog of scientific induction applied to mathematics. That is, we have mathematics as a, as a natural science in the sense we've got a bucket of millions of theorems and we ask the question, what is the thing that can be the underlying theory of these millions of theorems? Yeah, I agree, that's, right. that's a reasonable, go ahead. Yeah, no, sorry, no, ex exactly. I, I, th I think that's, yeah, that, that seems to me the closest meta-mathematical analog to the scientific induction perception analysis problem and, and relates to you know, your, your, your favorite example of, you know, how do we work out what axioms, you know, the proof of FLT is based on or something, right? That, that's that's right. essentially the, the, the reason why that question is kind of non-trivial to answer is effectively, you know, is a computational irreducibility story of exactly the same kind, I think, as the computational irreducibility of taking some, you know, some arbitrary physical system and working out what its underlying rule set is. Well, but okay, but that's a that's a higher level. Look, the computational irreducibility, given the rule set, what's it going to do? Then there's a, a never, another level, which is kind of the the exponentially more difficult case of, given the system, find what rule set it it has. Because right. to find what rule set it has in principle, you're reduced to saying, let me try this rule set, let me see what it does. Well even trying it might involve computational reducibility. I mean, that's the story of the whole, you know, Greg Chaitin's whole, you know, Omega business and so on is closely related to even if you try it, it's hard to know what it will do. Right. But I like your, your analogy there with sort of scientific induction and the development of mathematical axiom systems, because I think that's, because um, uh, that is something we haven't done for a hundred years, right? We are about to celebrate the hundredth anniversary of Zamelo Sprinkel set theory. And that's the last time I think people seriously imagined, you know, so there was a period, there was sort of a, a critical period of 40 years or something when people were like, the axioms of mathematics are up for grabs. And then it's like, okay, now they're set, you know, let's keep going for the next hundred years. Um, I mean, you know, go ahead. I'd argue, I'd argue we're still seeing that. 
Um, and, and there's been a resurgence of that kind of spirit, but it's it's occurring within a different crowd. So, um, you know, th there's there's still, you know, essentially a fine, uh, there's, there's a foundational crisis occurring right now within mathematics in the context of people trying to develop, you know, computational foundations, people trying to develop theorem provers, proof assistants and things. And there are big arguments now about, you know, is it is it dependent type theory? Is it homotopy type theory? Is it calculus of construction? That's a good point. Um, yeah. But, but it's, for whatever reason, that seems to be less a problem. Most mainstream mathematicians don't seem to care about those questions, which may have been true in the 20th century as well. I don't know. It may have been that most mainstream mathematicians didn't care about that either. Uh, didn't, you know, didn't care about ZFC then either. I think it depended on what country you were in. I think in, you know, in the Hilbert zone, there were a lot of people who cared about that. For some reason, I have the impression that the, the British zone was not didn't care so much about that. Um, the, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, people like, I, I can't, I mean, G.H. Hardy did write one article about transfinite numbers, but that was about it. Um, it was very I, boring. It, it, was, um, it was a comment on, it seems to be a comment on some of Bertrand Russell's work. It, it was. was, I think they hung out at, you know, in, in the, in the, in the, you know, at high table or something. And so that, that was about the level of, um, um, uh, was Bertrand Russell was at Trinity also, wasn't he? So they must have yes, been, yeah, they, they, they must they, have been they, like having dinner together all the time. Yes, um, and, I, and, and Hardy, when, when Russell was uh, expelled from Trinity for, for circulating some anti-war pamphlet, Hardy, I think, was the, the, one of his main Oh, defenders. that's right. Yeah, that's right. I, I remember this story, yes. So, so okay, so they had some, some dinner connection, so to speak, so that's probably why he wrote that article. I mean, although it did lead into the pretty interesting thing about these orders of infinity business. I mean, that was what that led into for Hardy, was trying to, and we finally had a chance to use that in our whole asymptotics stuff for, for Wolfram language and recent versions. That's all based on this, you know, e to the e to the e to the e to the x, log, 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 log x type stuff, which was a Hardy thing that came out of his transfinite business. That was the finite version, I think, of the attempt to understand orders of infinity transfinitely, so to speak. We'll, we'll come, we, we should come back to transfinite stuff in a minute, because I've, I've got a whole transfinite um, story here, which I don't yet understand. But, but I, want to, I want to come back to your, your claim, which I think is very interesting, um, that you know, in modern times, right, absolutely, these different proof assistant systems, you know, lean, cock, metamath, whatever, they, they have vastly different underlying foundational logics. And isn't that incredibly bizarre and scary? I mean, like, how could you ever know what was true? So why do people not care about that? Because in other words, the, 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 I think the reason is it's some kind of universality claim. And here's, here would be my claim. The claim is that's the underlying machine code. There's different machine codes there. But by the time you've built Pythagoras' theorem, it doesn't really matter. So in other words, that there's a layer on top of that stuff that is somehow, uh, you know, I mean, this, this will be a hypothesis that basically the underlying stuff may be very different, but by the time you're building to everyday mathematics, it all looks the same. Is that plausible? I mean, it yeah, certainly no, better be the case. Sure, I mean, I, I think that's a plausible claim, but I think it's one that one has to be very, very careful about because we know there are important counterexamples to that, right? And I think the counterexamples happen when the axiom systems, where the objects, being described by the axiom systems are too similar, right? We, we know that, okay, obviously ZFC is computation universal, Piano arithmetic is computation universal, but there's more stuff, there's way more stuff you can prove in ZFC than you can prove in Piano arithmetic. That they're, they're, they're not, you know, from a, from a pure, you know, proof theoretic expressive power point of view that they're, they're, they're by no means the same. What you're saying is that you know, effectively, your statement is we could build up some structure in piano arithmetic within which we could then prove all the same theorems as we could prove in ZFC. But that structure, yeah. very, very, you know, you, you would end up with a different model of the integers from the actual underlying model of the integers that you started from and things like that. And that would be a very strange kind of system in which to prove theorems. So it, it's, <laughs> sorry. Right. I mean, that's similar to the alien physics problem. That is, if you build ZFC within piano arithmetic, which you surely could do, you know, you start building up some whole structure that represents a set symbolically, and you use basically the computational abilities of piano arithmetic, and you build the whole thing, you will end up with a very bizarre description of sets. So right. similarly, it's probably the case, you know, aliens doing physics who build up a very different model of the sort of fundamental stuff of space and time could, could build computationally a system for describing the universe. It just wouldn't have the same, it wouldn't have the same 
not actual primitives, but wouldn't have the same conceptual primitives as the as as what we have. Right, um, and I think one of the things that would make I, I, well, my claim would be that that your that this this compiler of essentially ZFC to piano arithmetic, one of the things that would be most conceptually difficult is that it would have its own model of the integers in it, but that it would be radically different to the actual underlying piano model of the integers that you started from. And Which, the by the way, I mean, let's be realistic. Piano arithmetic has many possible models of the integers. I mean, that's what one of the things, one of the consequences of well, Gödel's theorem. Yes, so no, no, fair enough. Yes. Your, your claim is, okay, so that's an interesting claim. Okay, so we've got the standard integers. We know from Gödel's theorem that piano arithmetic admits non-standard models of the integers, which have all kinds of exotic properties. Your claim is the integers that I'd need to build ZFC in piano arithmetic are even more bizarre and exotic than the most communal garden bizarre and exotic ones that come out from, from being possible according to Gödel's theorem. That would be right. your, your... And, and, and in a sense, okay, we, we actually already see this in the Wolfram language theorem prover amongst other places. We see a version of this, right? Because so, uh, okay. The way that internally our, our predicate logic theorem prover works is we have a very, very fast uh, theorem proving system for first order equational logic, for the, for the equational, fra you know, for fragments of first order logic with equality. Um, doing theorem proving over, over full first order logic arbitrary, with arbitrary predicates that aren't equality is generally much slower because you have to do resolution and unification and all this other stuff. So to speed it up, what we do is we convert everything into equational logic. For, we, we, we do scholarization and we convert everything into an equational tautology and we do theorem proving over the equations because it's just more efficient that way. One of the weird consequences of that, though, is that you, you, end up with, you end up with two different models of the equal sign. You end up with the underlying model of equality that you're using for the equational theorem prover. And you also end up with this kind of higher order equality that's in the first order system. So like, uh, for instance, when we formalize the field axioms, this is the first place where this becomes a kind of significant philosophical issue, is in the field axioms, you have a mixture. It's, it's mostly algebraic. It's mostly equational. But there's in the division axiom, there is an implication sign so that there's a there's a part of it that is not that is first order not purely equational so you end up basically where, where the you end up in the situation where the equality symbol for the for the field axioms is different has a different meaning to the equality symbol of the underlying logic and and, and all i'm saying is that yeah you if you tried to build zfc in piano arithmetic you would you, you'd face exactly the same problem i mean in a sense the fact that we can build first order logic on equational logic, even though first order logic seems much richer, is the same story. I mean, equational logic is, you know, is computation universal, and so it can simulate first order logic, but the construction leads to these weird pathologies like you have two different equal signs and things. Let's like take that. that idea apart for a second, a little bit more, because that's very interesting. So, I mean, the basic point is there is a, a purely symbolic equal sign that is a thing that is just a creature of predicate logic. It's just a predicate like any other predicate that is represented symbolically. And then there is the raw, we really mean it's equal, equal, equal sign, right? And this, this relates, I mean, in a lot of these things that we're looking at, this whole question of isomorphism comes up over and over again, right? So the equality sign and the base logic there is a, are these things equal? Are they, are they well, in that situation, it's are they the same? It's not, just, it's not are they equal, it's are they the same, right? It's, it's, they are symbolically have to be the same. It's not just that they have some, am I right or am I, am I confused? I mean, if they are equal, in what, what is the meaning of equal in, in the base logic? So, so in, in, in the base, in equational logic, the, or the, yeah, in the base logic, equals just means that there exist uh, rewrite sequences for both sides of the equality. Fine. Reduce them to a normal form where the normal forms are syntactically equal. Where, you know, right, so in fact, we've got three equal signs running around here. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, we've got the, the raw, it really is symbolically equal. We've got the, it is equivalent in the sense that there exist transformation rules that will make the, the manifestly equal. And we've got this constructed equal sign that is just a predicate that could be a less than sign or anything else. So let's try to understand that this, this, it is raw equal. You know, we've had this issue, we have this issue in the physics project as well, of understanding what it means, you know, when we have, for example, hypergraph isomorphism as a, you know, as a thing to determine the merging of, 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 uh, of paths in the multiway graph. You know, it seems kind of, um, you know, we've discussed this at great length. It seems kind of, you know, what does it mean that the universe is doing hypergraph isomorphism? And the answer is, that probably isn't the question you should be asking. What is the question you should be asking is to an observer of the universe, 
those two things are considered the same. And where that really comes, you know, where something really happens there is in the observer. Because it's as if the whole universe is just branching, 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 but many states that the universe ends up in are considered the same by the observer. And so for purposes of making a theory of what's going on, you consider them to merge. So in what sense is that similar to what's happening in mathematics? In other words, that in the, the real universe, whatever that might mean, it's just branching, branching, branching. But to the observer trying to make sense of the universe, there's plenty of merging going on as well, because there are many things that are at that point, in some sense, syntactically equal although the hypergraphs are not quite as syntactically equal as the theorem prover is making things syntactically equal. Like, for example, we could imagine a theorem prover. Okay, so here's a question. Could we imagine a theorem prover for hypergraphs where the base equality was a graph isomorphism? Yeah, we've got one. Well, right. I mean, that's the... Right. Well, so, okay, well, hold on a second. So that... You, you mean that's the version of find equational proof that, no, I, I uh, well, I, I mean this. Hang on. You built one. Okay. Yeah. The, hey, we can bring that up, I suppose. Um, all right. Why not? Let's be concrete here. Hold on one second. Let's, um, uh, although, let's not get too. Um, oops. Ag. What did I just do with this? Uh, Which, you know, which I'm not sure I've ever used this function. Have I used this function? I, okay. I don't think so. so oddly enough, this I was going to say, the, the reason I built this is, is this conversation intersects in a very unexpected, somewhat unexpected way with the thing that I'm currently writing, which is about uh, ZX calculus and uh, categorical theorem proving uh, in, in, in categorical quantum mechanics, because we face the same problem there as well. Of effectively doing, you know, what what happens when you do theorem proving with a non-trivial isomorphism function or not a non-trivial notion of extensionality? What what is the what is the notion in the categorical quantum mechanics case? Well, so so there, okay, so so there you have again, you, there are several levels, right? So you've got you have two zx diagrams, and one is you want to ask, are they just graph theoretically? Are they isomorphic, right? That, that that's that's already one level, and, and because we're representing them as operator systems. That's already slightly non-trivial to determine. But then there's also the question of, are they equivalent modulo the ZX rules? That's another level of equality and, and so on. Um, and, and then you could even ask, you know, are, they are they equivalent modulo some, uh, some kind of evolution relation, which is actually what we care about in the multi-way case. And that's, a, that's another level still. Um, well, but so, okay, just, just zooming out on that for a second. I mean, so, so the main objective there, I mean, your main practical objective is proving equivalence of quantum circuits and things and simplification yeah. of quantum circuits. Exactly. Actually, not just proving equivalence, but actually proving more general theorems. Like, like the 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 um, the the nice use case example that I'm putting in this paper is we can prove that the correctness of the quantum teleportation protocol, the, or the standard uh, formulation of the quantum teleportation protocol, using this approach. Because you're, you're and yeah, okay. Ultimately, that that boils down to it's not just one equivalence between diagrams. It's actually you you you. It's ultimately a, a it's a quantified equivalence between diagrams. So it's actually a, uh, an equivalence between an infinite schema of diagrams, but but it's the, 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 yeah, the idea is still the same. Well, so just, just to zoom out on that for a second, I mean, so what you're doing there is proving program properties, which is something you might use a classical theorem prover for. You know, you're trying to prove some property of some program, yes? It's just that, that you know, if, you're, if your language is something like WL, then that's kind of hard to do because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's such a rich, diverse language. That it's hard to yeah, right. And, and as we build a, a more sophisticated compiler for it, that becomes, I mean, you know, that, that's uh, more and more evident that proving theorems about things in the language is difficult. I mean, by the way, my, my, my current uh, sort of flip point is that people, you know, people build these immensely complicated type systems. And my claim is that even if you have a language whose basic capabilities are quite simple, you're actually building a symbolic language in the type system. So you don't have a symbolic language, we just have a symbolic language, but um, we don't have a type system, but you could have a much simpler language and then build up all kinds of layers of symbolic stuff within the type system, which I think is just utterly obscure. But, but, let's, but let's come back to this question about, so proving program Correctness. Yeah. So all, all I was going to say is that obviously, you know, with something like with categorical quantum mechanics and with the ZX calculus in particular, you know, 
that's a much, much more restrictive computational language. You've only got basically three objects or three kinds of objects and about 10 or maybe 10 or maybe 12 underlying instructions that you could in principle apply. And so that's that's a much more that's a much more reasonable thing about which to prove theorems. Right. Although although I, one thing I want to highlight is the character of the theorems, which are quantum theorems instead of classical program theorems. And I'm trying to understand what the when you prove a theorem, okay, so for a, for a classical program, you might prove a theorem that says the program can never reach this state. It's a Turing machine, it's a classical Turing machine, and it can never reach this particular halt state, for example, right? But so what is the analogy between, you know, I was just studying multi-way Turing machines, and um, uh, what is the analogy between proofs about quantum circuits and proofs about multi-way Turing machines? So a classical, a classical sort of proof of correctness might be this Turing machine can never get stuck. And so what is the quantum analog of that? Is the quantum analog saying no branch of this multi-way Turing machine can ever get stuck or what? Well, that, that's, that's one kind of thing you could prove, but the more general cases, all, all we're doing here is we're considering proofs of theorems at the, at the branchial level rather than the state level. Um, that, you know, that, that's the key insight. I mean, so, so our, our first ZX paper, the kind of, the, you know, the, well, one of the kind of headline results within that was showing that our category, the category of branchial graphs, which I sort of slightly cryptically called BR graph in, in, uh, in boldface, uh, has the same uh, categorical properties as the category of ZX diagrams. In other words, it forms this so-called dagger symmetric monoidal category object. So in a sense, we, we can manipulate our branchial graphs like we would manipulate ZX diagrams. And so when we take a disjoint union of multi-way rules, you know, that's like taking a monoidal product of diagrams, for instance. Um, okay. So what that means is when, when we're talking about proving equivalences between ZX diagrams, what we're really doing is proving uh, statements about, you know, obtainability of one branchial, you know, br uh, branchial subgraph, say, from, from, a, from a different branchial subgraph. That's, an, that's a general, a more general case of, of theorems you could prove. But that's interesting, because I mean, in, in the multi-way Turing machine case, as you, as you know, you know, I found this incredibly trivial multi-way Turing machine with one state, you know, three cases in its rule, which looked plausibly universal. So the question was, how would you how would you establish that? What would be a what will be a thing? And so what you're talking about is is mappings between. I mean, because okay, in traditional computation, one is thinking about there's an input, there's going to be an output, there's a single path. What you're talking about is lumps of branchial space mapping to lumps of branchial space, right? Right. You, lo looks like you're about to pull something up on the screen. Is that? Yeah. It? Sorry. I, I, well, I was. Just, I, I I know we don't want to make this too visual. A uh... Well, we can we go, go ahead, pull something interesting. Oh, just, quickly show, so, so with one of, oops, sorry, with one of these proofs here, uh, each of these diagrams that you see in this proof graph is essentially a, is, is either a whole branch-like hypersurface or a, or a section of a branch-like hypersurface. So when we take, I mean, these are fairly trivial ones. This is the complete proof of correctness of the quantum teleportation protocol. So the reason why I say it's kind of an infinite proof schema whoa, whoa, is- whoa, whoa, wait, 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 what on earth is this creature? Okay, so under behind there, we see a traditional find equational proof proof diagram. Yes. And in front, we see the illustration of each, what each lemma actually is represented diagrammatically in ZX calculus, is that right? That is exactly right, yes. And so, so the, the, the point is that each of these, okay, we know that in ordinary ZX calculus, you know, each of these diagrams could be plumbed into some larger diagram, right? You, you yes. The input wires and output wires plumbing them in. Similarly, a, a, a branchial subgraph can be plumbed into a much larger branch-like hypersurface. So when we actually state an, equa an equation like this, it's not just a single equation, it's actually a, it's a infinite parametric family of equations relating branch-like hypersurfaces together. Um, and so, so, so in effect, what we're doing when, when we produce a proof like this is we're saying this particular infinite class of branch-like hypersurfaces can be converted you know, or can be evolved to yield this other particular you know, infinite collection of branch-like hypersurfaces. Uh, and, and that's sort of the, that's the general form of these, of these theorems in, in quantum logics. So, I mean, this reminds me of sort of in dynamical systems theory, you know, you're looking at the evolution of a measure and things like that. I mean, what you're looking at here is instead of, instead of looking at the evolution of states, you're looking at the evolution of, of you know, measures on ensembles of states and so on. I mean, that, that will be the dynamical systems way of thinking about it. But right. so, so what you're saying is, so then equivalence for you in this 
you know, lump of branchial space thing, that, that notion of equivalence is something quite complicated. That's, a, that's an equivalence of ZX diagrams at some level. Yeah, exactly. So you, you have to mod out, not as I say, not just by the not just by the graph iso, you know, by digraph isomorphism, but also by this more sophisticated collection of ZX diagrammatic rewriting rules. See, see, the thing that gets scary for me is that you know, in the end, you say, well, you know, I want to mod out by the the set of all possible transformations, and then you're going to be thrown into undecidability. So, I mean, what you know, whatever your isomorphism test is, it better be decidable. It's going to be okay. So, how do how do we think about this? The basic point is, if isomorphism is in the eye of the beholder, the eye of the observer, so to speak. In other words, if in truth the universe is branching, it's just that we perceive it not to be branching because there are things that seem isomorphic to us. Then the question would be, what? Uh, then it better be the case that if we have. You know, this is the question of how how far how big can the isomorphism, pro, you know, uh, making be, and that relates to your interpretation of quantum mechanics in terms of completions and so on, right? Because that that's basically saying, what what you're doing if you add lemmas to say this this is now considered equivalent, right? You, the question is to to you know actualize this question of what equivalence corresponds to. Which right, right. Or, or if I if I could flip that around, if we if we take a kind of if we take the physics first intuition, what that's really saying is anytime you have an equational axiom in some mathematical system, you can think about that as being a kind of statement of observational equivalence between you know between classes of states, right? So so if you know if we, suppose we have some algebraic axiom system and I, and I introduce a, a you know an axiom of commutativity. We can interpret that as saying I'm, I'm modding out by all by all sort of symmetric transformations, or in other words, an observer in this in this region of mathematical space cannot distinguish between symmetrized you know versions of expressions, something like right. that. Well, so the typical observer in mathematical space, you know, when you read a paper and the paper says x plus one, or it says one plus x, you kind of immediately you know smoosh those together. Yet, so, you know, reading a paper about category theory and understanding its correspondence to algebraic number theory or something is not something that you immediately do. So there's a certain uh, distance that you go. There's a certain translation uh, you know, volume, a geodesic volume in ruleal space, so to speak, that corresponds to how far you're prepared to translate from one system to another to which consider think, it equivalent. Which I think brings us on nicely to what was what, to the, sort of the intended topic of today by, by discussing essentially what does a resource bounded isomorphic? Or, okay, if we take these notions like propositional uh, extensionality, type extensionality, and so on that exist in conventional logic, what would a resource bound version of extensionality look like? I think it's right. kind of what we're inching towards. Right, right, right. So, so I mean, I think that, and that's relevant both for physical observers and potentially for metamathematical observers. But I don't completely yet understand. For physical observers, I think we pretty well understand what resource bounding means. So, for example, you know, just to run through for, for people, I, I know Jonathan knows this, but, but um, uh, you know, in statistical mechanics, for example, resource bounding has to do with, you know, no Maxwell's demons that can, you know, go and, uh, you know, sort of unravel what's happening to the gas molecules we just treated as, um, you know, determined by pressure and temperature and so on. I guess resource bounding in the case of space time um, is a story of only, I mean, there's a couple of different issues there. One is being sensitive only to causal connections. That's one sense. I'm not sure that that's necessarily resource bounding. I think that's being part of the system, which is a little different from resource bounding. Resource bounding is saying that you can't have arbitrary ornate gravitational fields being attributed. You know, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't make, well, let's see, how does this work? So there's, there's a couple of different issues. One issue which we have, which we probably, which I'm not sure whether we have in metamathematics, is the observer is part of the system question. Because the fact that we are only sensitive to causal connections is a consequence of the fact that we are part of the system, right? But the fact that we can only deal with certain kinds of foliations in space time, that's a consequence of resource bounding, right? right. And I, I don't think that the, so, the, the fact that we can only consider sort of smooth versions of what happens in a gas, that's a resource bounding question. There is probably some confusion that perhaps comes up in people's analyses of Maxwell's demon about sort of being part of the system. But I don't think that's really the point for the gas molecule case. I think that's, that's not a part of the system issue. So then 
then in the case of the in the quantum mechanics case, it's again a part of the system issue, as well as a resource bounding issue. So I mean, the part of the system issue is uh, our brains branch just like the universe branches, and so we are. The question is what what maybe there's a quick answer to this question at this point. Um, you know, what can a branched brain perceive about a branching universe? Just like the same question for the in in space time. An, an observer who's part of the system can only perceive causal relationships. Is it obvious what a branched brain can perceive in a branching universe, so to speak? Is that again, is that just the multi-way causal graph? I think it is. Well, the multi-way causal graph is what they would perceive if, well, the multi-way causal graph is what all possible branches of the brain are capable of perceiving. But if you enforce the condition that the brain has to come to a coherent view of what happened, then the then the only thing that the branch brain could reasonably you know could conclude about what happened are the set of completable outcomes from from that branching process. Um, by completable outcomes, you mean finitely completable, as in a finite collection of lemmas can lead to that result. Yes. Well, so what does that mean in terms of branchial space? Because in, in general, you know, different parts of branchial space will be spread, spread far apart and they will not all be completable. It would need, it would need too big a collection of completions to, you know, to bring them all together. So then the question is, and I think this probably relates to the whole discussion about branchial coordination and destructive interference and all those kinds of things. But, but so your claim is the brain, the bounded observer brain, has only a finite bucket of completions that it can have. Is that the basic claim? That's a way of parameterizing yeah. the resource bounding of the brain is only a finite number of completions. Right, right, exactly. And so one way to look at that would be, so it's a bounded region of branchial space. Is that right? Yes, uh, I mean, where, where bounded region doesn't necessarily re refer to geometrically bounded, it just refers to you know, complexity bounded. Well, let's understand that. What is the geodesic? So in branchial space, there's a notion of a, you know, a geodesic ball in branchial space that's defined by branchial distance. But you're now introducing another distance in branchial space, which is the sort of completability distance. What is the relationship between these things? Well, I, d I don't think there is a particularly straightforward one because one of them depends on the structure of the rules and the other one doesn't. W which... Wait a minute, which one does not depend? I mean, the, the branchial space just is what it is. It's been, it's been created in some way, and you can yeah. start measuring GD6 on it that don't right. depend on... But that, that's completely independent of the, of the structure of the rules. Okay, but, but so you're identifying a different thing, which is essentially the translation... But the, 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 the point is, the, the, com the completion distance does make it, you know, does matter, or does, is affected by the structure of the rules. Because if I have a branch pair and I perform a completion, the key question is, does that then produce, does, does the new set of rules I've introduced introduce more branch pairs? And if it does, does it introduce on average more or fewer branch pairs than the ones I started with? And that in a sense depends on what rules you've already got. Uh, and it also depends on the structure of the states in the individual. But how the, would you think about this? Okay, so, so you're, you're imagining this, you, you introduce these rules. That is like introducing a move in branch hill space, so to speak. You're, you're introducing some particular, some particular piece of motion in branch hill space. And there's a question of what, you know, if you, if you apply that, you have a whole collection of these things, how far can you get? So I, 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 know we, I know we're trying to kind of build up to the metamathematics thing by talking about physics first. I think in many ways, it's actually easier to understand in the metamathematics case, right? So Go ahead. imagine, yeah. okay, let's reformulate this question of, what, you know, metamathematical space is branching, right? Because in general, mathematical axiom systems are non-confluent. So, you know, you can reformulate your question as what could a branched automated theorem prover conclude about a branched metamathematical space? So suppose for a moment you, you had essentially like a, you had a quantum theorem prover that would just mm -hmm. follow a superposition of all possible paths in metamathematical space. And as soon as it found a proof of the theorem it cared about, it would say, ah, oh, I found the path and it would you know, destructively interfere with all the other paths and you just get one answer or something, right? So that, 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 would, be, that would be an example of, a, of an automated theorem prover which doesn't have to come to one conclusion about what the proof was. It can, it, you know, it can, it can spread out and, and you know, essentially sample all possible proof directions and only one of them has to sort of work out. Whereas what we do 
with conventional automated theorem proving algorithms, which are implemented on classical computers, is we we enforce the constraint that there can only be what you, you can't have the superposition of possible proofs. There has to be a single proof. So then you eat. So even though the um, even though metamathematical space is branching, and therefore by extension, at least locally, the theorem prover is branching, ultimately, it has to come to one conclusion about what the proof was. And so, the, so you can ask, well, what what are what are the class of possible proofs that you can you can derive using that using such a technique? And that class is essentially limited by what proofs could you construct given a finite number of you know a finite number of completion rules, a finite number of applications of essentially the inference rules of superposition and paramodulation that are the basis of completion. Okay, so hold on. So first point here is the introduction of the idea of a quantum theorem prover, which I don't think we've heard from before. So that's a, um, and, and, but I mean, what you're talking about there is a non-deterministic theorem prover in that rather than, I mean, then, then we, you know, you segued from the theorem, it, it goes through many branches, you know, like a factoring problem or something. And one of them, I mean, in fact, as we know, because we looked this up recently, Stephen Cook's original paper about MP completeness was about the difficulty of theorem proving. It was not about the difficulty of, of these kind of more, you know, of the kinds of things people now talk about in satisfiability or graph algorithms or whatever else. But in any case, the, the, um, uh, so the, the idea then is that in the quantum theorem prover, the quantum theorem prover is getting a superposition of results. And it is, you know, like, a, like any good quantum computer, it has to actually come to a conclusion. So it has to do something to work itself down to getting a definite answer. And your claim is, imagine, okay, so you're, you're thinking about, imagine, what is the analog of quantum measurement for a quantum theorem prover? Well, it, it, is, it is completion. Um... Right. Well, you're saying you're saying the innards of our theorem prover actually are quantum, and we are simply we, we are the, the way that the theorem prover works is by quantum measurement. Effectively, is by your your theory of quantum measurement, basically. Right. It, it, yeah. In in some sense, that that's that's effectively what's happening, right? Because you're you're um, if you don't complete your system. Then you know you have some arbitrary non not you know non globally confluent term rewriting system. You're going to end up with with some branched collection of proofs, and you know, for, un, uh, you know, un, unless you kind of systematically explore all possible. Well, you can't even really systematically explore all possible branches because you know you're going to end up with some kind of depth first uh, halting problem. Uh, but even if you could, it would be horrendously inefficient. So you don't do that. What you do is you you know at, at, at every you you evolve branched for a bit. And then you perform completions to kind of collapse things back, and then you evolve branch for person. Then it wow, evolves. it's just the same as quantum computing, right? Right. I mean, so let's look at that analogy a bit more carefully. So, I mean, one point is the reason you can't explore all the paths in physics is because time is inexorably moving on. In the case of a theorem prover, you could, in principle, do it by freezing it and just doing a depth first search. But in physics, you don't get to do that because you know the time of all these branches. It's it's you know. The, the the time time moves on, so to speak. Well, and so you, you don't have time to go look at the other branches. If you had a computer that sort of existed outside of the universe, then you could, in principle, do that, right? If, if it right. wasn't constrained by physical time, yeah. Right, but, but in physical time, by the time it could explore the branch, the branch has already changed. Um, but okay, so so let's consider the quantum theorem prover. So the basic the basic claim would be inside the theorem prover, you know, it's treeing out a lot of things, but it is using the same method to come to a conclusion that you're claiming is used in quantum mechanics. Namely, that it is judiciously, now in the theorem prover, it's judiciously picking uh, completions to use. And whether that's the right theory for us humans or not is not clear to me. That is, you know, we might be born with a certain collection of completions effectively, and that's all we have. And anything that doesn't complete with those completions, we can't come to a conclusion about. Well, it's, I mean, it's actually not that judicious, as, as again, as I've recently discovered in writing this second ZX paper, that the, the OK, so uh, at the risk of getting a bit into the weeds here. So, so in terms of the, the actual deductive inference rules that equational theorem proofers are based on, the, the, the primary ones are these things called there's equality resolution, there's ordered factoring, and then there are these superposition slash paramodulation rules, which are the basis of the, of the completion stuff. And generally, when you do uh, superposition and paramodulation, 
it's done relative to the reduction ordering. So you have a reduction ordering on the terms, and then at, any st at every step you select which completions, which paramodulations and so on to apply by picking the subterms that are maximal with respect to the reduction ordering. What I figured out was that you could generalize that a bit and you could replace, rather than just picking things that were maximal with respect to the reduction ordering, you could define a selection function over your subterms that defined a different ordering and then you, uh, that was completely arbitrary and not dependent on the reduction ordering. And you could use that to select which things you were going to complete on the basis of. And then, it, and then what I showed was that if you have, if you pick the reduction, if you, know, if you pick the selection function based on causal edge density, you end up with a more efficient collection of completions than you would have done with the traditional reduction ordering approach. So it's, it's the it seems to be the case that actually the, even the theorem provers aren't picking completions that judiciously. It's not, they don't so do basically that. what you're saying is, you know, this causal edge density thing is, I mean, it's a very evolutionary kind of idea in the following sense that, you know, those, those lemmas which have highest causal edge density are the, the lemmas to use are the most used lemmas basically is, is what that heuristic is saying. And right. what that could turn into is the completions we have, the completions that have been most useful are the completions we have, so to speak. So in other words, you know, one could imagine a natural selection version, even one could imagine sort of a genetic algorithm approach to your, you know, choice of, I don't even know how your machine gets started of, of you know, using causal edges and then to what extent, okay, do you know if it's stable? That is, if it starts using, let's say it starts using a particular lemma, then that lemma will be used more. Then that will define what direction it's going. And the question would be, you could get stuck in a local minimum where you you are, because you picked this lemma, because that ammonite had this very unfortunate accident in the Precambrian period, that caused this whole branch of, of uh, possibilities to disappear. Um, and is that, do you know that, I mean, I bet, well, you probably haven't studied that yet, but I mean, it, it, in principle, one could imagine that could happen. That is a heuristic, which says, your heuristic is basically, it's like a credit assignment heuristic, I think, right? For, for in, the, in the same sense as the machine learning ones doing those kinds of things. And you're asking, so I think it, it sounds to me like you, what you're talking about is a forward evolutionary heuristic. That is. Right. Ex except, okay, so it, it's it's true it can get stuck in a local minimum, but it could only get stuck in a local minimum if the conventional theorem proving approach would also have got stuck in a local. Oh sure, minimum. those conventional one is is toast. We we already understand that one is. The, the, re the reason being it's uh, the, the, and this is an important consistency condition to to explain why it's not just a heuristic or at least it's only a heuristic if you treat standard theorem proving approaches as being heuristics, which they are. Uh, which they extent. are heuristics. Yeah yeah okay they're 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 semi yeah I mean yeah fine. Unfailing completion is only claimed to be a semi-decision procedure. So in that respect, you could claim it's heuristic. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it turns out you can prove that this ordering you get from the selection, the selection ordering is a well-founded relation if and only if the reduction ordering is also well-founded. So in other words, the, the, the reduction ordering approach would go into an infinite loop if it were not a well-founded relation. And it's only in that case that the selection function, would, the selection relation would also become not well-founded. Okay, so let's ask this question. So you're, you're trying to do something by completions there are, what kind of obstructions could exist to that? Like for example, if you're doing in space time, you know, obstructions are things like event horizons and so on. So what, what are the analogous, is, is there an analog of an event horizon in completion space? Yes, yes, there, there are. You can get the, I, f um, I, I forget the exact pathological example, uh, but the, yeah, there's, there's a class, I mean, this was part of what happened. Um, this is what led from the, original Knuth-Bendix algorithm to this so-called unfailing completion variant was the discovery of this whole collection of pathological examples that could basically cause Knuth-Bendix to go into infinite loops. Now, the unfailing completion also can go into infinite loops, but the pathological examples needed there are much are much more so pathological. Um, but uh, in, in general, anything where you have, um, anything where your completion rules become slightly too symmetrical, where you, you know, where, where effectively you end up in some loop where you're just kind of swapping around two elements of, a, of an expression, that, that's you know that's generally bad news. That you know those are places where your reduction ordering can become uh, can become not well founded. Um, What's the analog between that and a closed time like curve? They're probably quite analogous. I mean, yeah. so what does that mean? It means that you know the question is: Is there a Cauchy development in some sense for these um, for 
the making of um, completions. Right, right. I mean, well, I mean, which, in fact, we, we actually, we have a way in the physics project, we have a way of making that precise, right? Because um, when, when we describe foliated, when we describe foliatability of a causal graph, what do we really mean? Well, we, we, we mean that the associated space time is, is hyperbolic. And in particular, therefore, it can't have CTCs or degenerate CTCs. It can't have loops. It has to be a directed acyclic graph. Now, when we foliate a multi-way evolution graph, we also require effectively hyperbolicity of that underlying space as well, for the same reason. And it's the it's the choice of foliation that defines our set of completion rules, right? Because when, when we perform completions, we we complete with respect to states on a branch like hypersurface. So that, that that and that particular collection of states is at some level right. arbitrary. So yes. Yeah, so, so in order to be able to get a so we're in a sense we're in, by by enforcing this condition of foliatability, we're we're enforcing that. We, you know, we we can't get stuck in the situation where our where our completions are just kind of swapping things back and forth uh, indefinitely. Right, but that means that in the structure of branch hill space, that means that the um, okay. So what does it mean? What is a CTC? So that's interesting. I mean, so a CTC in space time is time travel. What is a CTC in branch hill space? It's probably also time travel, but it's a very bizarre kind of time travel. It's a time travel in which the um, what on earth is it? So, well, it's it's time travel, but just but only on one classical trajectory. Wait a minute. What do you mean? The so, if you if you had a you have a multi-way evolution graph that has say a single loop in it, what that's saying is that it's not that the whole quantum evolution would get you know would, would travel back in time. I understand. It's only, only the evolution of a single classical eigenstate that's traveling backwards in time. Okay, so what would that mean? So that means that if you're a brain and you're trying to complete things and there's a piece of what is going on that is uncompletable for this reason, that is, what on earth would that mean? Well, I mean, th th this, this gets onto the problem of, you know, why we require hyperbolicity in order to have completions because, well, okay, so, you know, recall... I don't know. When I when I think about branch brains, I, I I like to think about it in this in this way. I, I think I've, I've told you before, right? You 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 consider the brain as somehow being external, as being separate from the exterior universe, and you consider universe isomorphism versus brain isomorphism, and you know the and 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 the and the so you, so you know universe branches, brain branches, and then the the case which is non-trivial is the case where you get uh, brains brains become isomorphic, but the exterior universes are non-isomorphic. And that's the case where the brain has to essentially define completion rules to, so that its own representation of the world becomes coherent because it has, you know, the brain thinks it lives in just one universe. So it can't have, you can't have the same brain kind of being compatible. with. Right, well, so this, this is the alien who's big enough to live across an event horizon. Right, exactly. But so, so, so the, the point is that that whole argument breaks down completely once you have essentially a closed branch like oh, no we shouldn't call it closed branch like curve, but once you have a ctc in branch your space because then it's not just that the brain you know comes to different conclusions about what the state of the universe is it's also the brain comes to different conclusions about what the what the local time in the universe is and what the local time in the brain is and and it's kind of hard to see how you could make that co coherent uh particularly you know if it's if well, it's allowed well okay but the way to think about a CTC in space time is just you're not sure what time it is. That is, you know, there's a time now, there's a time in the past, there's a time in the future, whatever. All these times are conflated with each other. Right. And so I think it's the same thing in this branch like case that, um, but I don't quite know what it means in terms of. Um, yeah, okay, but, but, but what that would imply is suppose you could, you could construct a completion. For such a you know for such a multi-way graph, you would end up with the situation that after the post-completion, you would have no notion of time, because you would have right of right right because you've you've equated all that's right. So so it's it's analogous to a time-like singularity, right? In fact, so so I suspect what you'd end up with is essentially a complete graph, or something like it, something with, which is completely unstructured. Well, but but more to the point, you end up with something where there is no notion of time. Where, where all time has been conflated together, right? right? Which is the same thing that happens in a time-like singularity in, in space-time. That right. all time, you know, is, uh, boy, it reminds me of the aliens in the Arrival movie. 
they had that they had that issue. Um, the uh, um, but so that's an interesting case. So I mean, in, in that's a way of thinking about because we don't usually in space time we don't usually think about completions. Why don't we think about? Let's think. Why do we not think about? Yeah, it's a different way of viewing it. Okay, but but but. Well, I mean, in, in a in a sense, so. so Okay, my way of thinking about it is that clock synchronization across a simultaneity surface is the analog of a completion in space-time. Right. That's you, probably you, correct. You have a bunch of different space-time events and, and on the surface, they all look independent. But what you're gonna say is I'm gonna enforce a, an equivalence relation that says that all of the clocks are synchronized across this space-like hypersurface. And in effect, you can think of that as being actualized by a bunch of individual synchronization rules that are being introduced to the causal graph. But it doesn't have quite the same, does it have the same, in, in some kind of Cauchy development, it has the same idea. By, by saying that those two things are connected, completed, if you have a good, you know, hyperbolic, you know, Cauchy development thing, that completion will survive, so to speak. Right. Whereas exactly. if it's a mess, that completion will not survive. Yeah, it, it won't remain consistent, yes. So what's the analogy between that and the making of new branch pairs? In the case of, if you make a completion in the multi-way case, and that completion in some sense stays consistent. Right. I mean, there's there's probably, but I want to come back to the theorem proving case, because I think that that's a, and I, I want to come back to the quantum theorem prover and your claim that we can understand what's going on. Okay, so first claim is that in the theorem prover, um, the uh, uh, the theorem prover has many paths that can follow, but what you're saying is that the way the way a theorem prover works, a, a, you know, a completion based theorem prover works is add enough critical pairs so that critical pair lemmas so that you can make the thing into a confluent system. Right. So what that's saying is, um, what is what is the analog of that in ordinary mathematics? That, that's somehow that's related to the whole uh, extensionality story and so on, right? Because, because what you're saying is there is a branch pair, there are, there are, are and then we're going to bring those back together. We're going, to, we're going to add a lemma that says those two things are equal. How does that relate to, uh, what, what, is, what is that action? I mean, in a theorem prover, we understand what that action is. For a working mathematician, what is the analogous action? Yeah, it's slightly. I, I I don't have a good answer. It's slightly harder to define. It, it's yeah. It's something like, well, in in the most general case, it's something like a lemma that that states. So you know, a substitution lemma is much more like an ordinary technical lemma that you would prove in the course of a you know of an ordinary theorem, right? A critical right. pair lemma is something more like a connection between two, two different fields of mathematics, or at least in, in in the grander case, that's what it would look like, right? It, it's. You're, you're, you're basically saying meta, the, you know, meta mathematical space can go off in these two different directions. It can go off, and you know, you could um, let me think of a concrete analogy. Uh, okay, so you, you, know, you, you might think that the, the study of analytical indices in PDEs and the study of topological indices in PDEs would go off in two completely different direct, you know, branches of meta mathematical space. The Atiya Singer index theorem is like a critical pair lemma that says, actually, no, there's a, there's a way I can hop from one branch to the other. And it's through this index theorem that, that relates the that's an equation that relates. All right. The so, so your claim is that, if, for example, take the simpler example of algebra versus geometry. Your claim is that a theorem that you start from a concrete thing in mathematics, you have two different description languages, and then there's a grand theorem that says this thing over here is equal to this thing over here. In by equating those description languages after you have done further developments in each of those description languages, even though they're both talking about the same thing. I mean, that's that's like your your circle versus your quadratic form or something. Um, exactly. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah, the, the, these are all very grand examples of what's usually quite a trivial thing, right? The the the, the, the yeah the, the the fundamental point I'm trying to make is that I mean, what is a critical pair lemma ultimately? What it is, it's a thing that says. There's this branch of metamathematical space. There's this branch of metamathematical space. But because they originated from the same place, as you say, 
I can, there's a rule I can use to hop from one to the other by, you know, but essentially converting uh, waypoints along one branch to waypoints along the other branch. Right. And it seems increasingly surprising as you go further on each branch. Ex exactly. Yeah. But it's a bit strange that the progress of a theorem prover is associated with critical pairs. Yet the progress of mathematics mostly is more associated with substitution lemmas. Now, interestingly, by the way, coming back to our friend Emil Post and his life in 1921, um, mostly the um, uh, you know what he thought he'd done is to reduce all of Principia Mathematica to substitution lemmas. He didn't have the idea of critical pair lemmas. He wouldn't have needed critical pair lemmas in principle. But the question is, are critical pair lemmas the microscopic version of kind of the analogies between fields of mathematics, so the cross-fertilization? I mean, are critical pair lemmas cross-fertilization of mathematics, a very junior granular version of cross-fertilization of mathematics? And if so, then a theorem prover is doing something which is actually pretty advanced in terms of what mathematicians do. Because mathematicians mostly live on single branches doing substitution lemmas and some first approximation. Well, I mean, as is the case with theorem provers in, in fairness. I mean, when you prove an arbitrary theorem using a theorem prover, most of the lemmas will be substitution lemmas. That's um, not what I've observed. In, in your very code, I mean, I've looked at many of these. I mean, let's bring one up. I, I don't think that's true. I mean, we can, we can count one. Why don't we count the one for, I, I don't think it's true. I think it's full of critical pair lemmas. Okay, let's find out if we're right about this. I mean, the proof of commutativity in your Boolean axiom may be a, may be a good counterexample for this, for my statement. Well, right, that was what I was gonna bring up. I mean, that one, let's, let's take a look at that one. Let's see. That's a, that's a slightly weird case. <laughs> Is it a weird case? I, well, I don't know, maybe it's not, let's, let's see. Well, I mean, that, that's a question of what- I'm prepared to retract my statement. I've, I've not looked into it as much as you have. Well, I, I've only, I've only, I'm only a, a you know, natural historian of proofs. I don't actually do proofs. I just look at them as, as like, like people, you know, it's like um, bird watching or something. Um, let's see, where is it? Applications, it's gotta be here somewhere. Basic logic, how about that? Okay, so a critical pair lemma is red. I reckon there's about the same critical number of critical pair lemmas here as there are. Um, I mean, we can obviously. Yeah, that's a fair point. Uh, let's let's take a look at another one. Let's let's see. Yeah, I mean, I think I, this is an interesting question. Actually, let's take a look at this guy. This is a good. This is a good juicy one. Um, let's uh, let's see. What do we want to do? We want to just. Oh shoot! This is. Um, uh, I want one. Why? See, this is the problem. We need to. Right. This we can just say. Just I mean, you, you you can use axiomatic theory for this. I should. I know that. I know that. I know that. I was going to. Okay. So let, let's just let's just for empirical mathematical purposes, let's um let's take that. Okay. Let's go prove it. Let's get a proof object, and then what do we do? We, we just take the proof data set, and we can count what what field in the proof data set is this thing. Uh, so if you if you take um, I guess if you do normal of the proof data set you take first of first that will tell you the type of lemma. Surely there's a way of doing that without saying normal. Uh, I don't know data set well enough. I'm I'm, I'm sure there is. Basically, okay. okay. The, the point is each of the keys in the data set it, it, it's proof data set. Sorry. Each of the keys in the proof data set is a list that says, you know, either axiom or hypothesis, critical pair lemma substitution, and then the number. I see. So if we get the keys of that data set, yeah. we're, we're mapping, oh, I actually don't know how to do that. Uh, let's think. We want the all of the data set. Well, uh, let's go your, your, your pedestrian route here. Keys of normal of this, right? I think so, yeah. Okay, there we go. And then it's just first of that. What, one of these days I will learn how to use data sets. Well, I think this particular one is a, is a okay, let's just do counts of this. And um, well, I'm afraid the critical pair lemma is actually win here. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, but so, so is this in fact very different from mathematics or is this, is this because of, I mean, what is our sense of why there are so many critical pair lemmas here? 
Well, I mean, you could make an argument that, well, obviously each of these critical polymers is, is nowhere near of the same magnitude as, you know. Uh, the Tersinger Ingatz theorem. Right, or, or anything close to that. And in, in a sense, you know, any time that we, I suppose, you know, any time you try and do, anal you know, basic analytic geometry, right? Any time you convert from a geometrical object to some coordinatized thing, you are using a whole bucket of critical pair levers. It's sort of implicitly when you do that, yeah, uh, you know, to convert between algebra and geometry, and and you know, th these are operations which I guess no practicing mathematician would would even think twice about doing or formalizing. So you could argue there's a huge number of just implicit critical pair levers that have been built up throughout the course of mathematical history that no one really addresses or, or explicitly acknowledges. Um, well, okay, but let's put it a different way. I mean, so we believe that critical pair lemmas in your interpretation of quantum mechanics are really important in our perception that definite things happen in the world. Okay, in mathematics, the question is, uh, well, the when we are taking different branches of algebra versus geometry, but we think something definite is happening mathematically, but yet we have two different views of what's happening. Yeah, well, the, the way I would phrase it is, wh why is it the case that we have one mathematics? You know, one might have thought that once mathematics diverged, once you have algebra, analysis, geometry, topology, et cetera, they would all go off in different directions and they'd all become completely independent fields. Mm -hmm. There is remarkable, you know, as an interesting mathematical fact, there is cross fertilization, there is cross you know, uh, polarization and so on, in how mathematics naturally develops, that you know theorems from one branch become applicable in other branches, um, and in effect, that's what get, when when you foliate metamathematical space, that cross fertilization is responsible for the cohesiveness of the spatial structure that you obtain, and that's the and the same is effectively true in arbitrary multiway graphs. That the the the, the 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 thing that allows you to have a cohesiveness of branchial space is the same thing that says that you can effectively impose completions, and that you know. It's, it's, it's the thing that, that ensures that you only have one, you know, in the end, you only have one multiway system. You, don't, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't sort of branch out and each, in each individual branch becomes its own multiway evolution. Graph. But let's talk about the relationship of causal invariance to the need for completions. I mean, so causal invariance says, ultimately you don't need completions, right? But right. completions, so a question about metamathematics is, is metamathematics causal invariant? In other words, if you waited long enough, would mathematics naturally converge? And is the presence of completions merely, you know, the effort of mathematicians to, to you know, make that convergence happen that is somehow, you know, not fundamentally... Uh, okay, what, what is... Is, is mathematics causal invariant? First question. I mean, that, I, 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 like, as I understand it, effectively, that's, a, that's asking the question of, is there some inevitable fundamental theory of mathematics that's kind of all directions of mathematics are kind of in, in, are inexorably progressing towards. And I don't think we know the answer to that. Although it is an interesting question. Right. I mean, and the analogy to that in physics would be, well, causal invariance in space time is associated with the fact that different reference frames I mean, there's a pretty direct analogy. I mean, it's different reference frames observe the same physics. The question is, do different approaches to mathematics really observe the same ultimate mathematical monster underneath? Right, right. Is the, yeah, is the causal structure? So yeah, it's, it's actually asking a, a finer grained version of that question, right? It's asking, essentially, is the, is the causal structure, which in metamathematics is something analogous to the lemma dependency structure, does that ultimately end up being the same, irrespective of which branch of mathematics you followed? Yeah, that's really weird. That's really weird. I mean, so that would be, what would be, what would be the sign of that? I mean, so that would be, well, you know what? Actually, it's not so weird because what that's about, what that's like saying is, do the methodologies for making things like proofs, are they the same in different areas of mathematics or are they different? Because that's kind of what the, you know, the, the job of the mathematician to make proofs, it could be the case that the physicist who's traveling in the spacecraft at 0.5 the speed of light is just has completely different physics. Whatever they learned in school was irrelevant because now they're in a spacecraft and you know, none of that physics works anymore. And it could be the case in that same sense that if you're in a different mathematical reference frame that, you're, you know, that all the methods you learned from in math school are irrelevant. 
right? So, so the claim would be different reference frames. So I think the analogous claim to the claim of relativistic invariance in physics is the claim that the same kinds of general proof approaches work in different areas of mathematics. Yes, which certainly seems to be true, at least to, to an extent, yeah. But how will we make that more precise? What's the more precise analogy of relativity in mathematics? So are we saying that the, um, well, I mean, one thing, one very concrete thing is the machinery still works, like the proof, you know, the theorem prover still works, right? That, that's, an, that's an interesting fact by itself. It could be the case that a theorem prover would work in one field of mathematics and just the mechanism would just gum up completely in another field of mathematics. And so the claim would be that in your kind of approach to, you know, heuristics or whatever you call it, for theorem proving, that those heuristics would not be much different between different fields of mathematics. Right, right. So in, in, in some sense, your claim about, um, uh, you know, the fact that the, the completions to use are the ones with lots of causal edges, that claim would be a claim that, that has to be independent of mathematical reference frame. Right, right. Well, that's interesting. That's a... Um, uh, that's pretty cool. If that's the case, that that uh, you know that we can view different fields of mathematics as, I mean, let, let's just explore that for a second. I mean, the question is, to what extent can we view different fields of mathematics as like different reference frames in math mathematical space? I mean, I think in some sense, but but with respect to one single structure. So that that's like saying, insofar as the models are like reference frames. That's like saying we've got this, this whole metamathematics and we think about that metamathematics sliced in terms of piano arithmetic or sliced in terms of something else. And um, those represent the reference frames, but the fact that the same underlying sort of proof structures work is the statement of relativity. Right, right. I mean, which, which is not so dissimilar to the standard way one would view it in mathematical logic, right? That, that Although we think about things like group theory, arithmetic analysis, et cetera, as being kind of axiom systems in their own right, they can all be defined essentially as models over ZFC set theory, say. Right. right. So, so, it, you, you can, so if, if your underlying proof system is ZFC set theory with some inference rules, you can treat them as just being models, just being reference frames in the, in the multi-way sense. But I'm, I'm curious, I mean, in terms of... of um, uh... You know, thinking about the, um, um, let, let's come back to this question about completion distance, because I think that's a really, it's an interesting question, which has not been properly explored. That is, you're, you're asking, you know, our brain, you know, okay, when we try and characterize what we can see in terms of gas molecules, for example, we kind of have a characterization of, uh, you know, what, um, uh, you know, we are an observer of a certain size relative to the molecules. We have some idea of what, how much averaging we're going to do. What is the analogous statement with respect to how much completion we can do? That has to, that, in quantum mechanics, that must be a decoherence question. Yes, although I think, de well, I think decoherence is, okay, this is, I, I, this is my own personal philosophical prejudice. I think decoherence is an emergent thing from the relative size point rather than the other way around. No, I'm sure that's correct. I'm sure that if we were, I mean, we would not, but the very fact that, the fact that we can have a classical view of the world is another size related thing. If we right. existed at a quantum scale, we would not have a classical view of the world. So, so I, I would argue in, in the metamathematical case, the analogous thing is, is in some sense, essentially distance between mathematics as it's practiced by mathematicians and mathematics as it's practiced by logicians, if you like, right? It's the, it's the distance between the ultimately desiccated formalized stuff and the actual concepts that are being dealt with in the, in the real dynamic field, right? right. That's, that's the distance, that's the macroscopic brain version is, you know, the mathematicians have macroscopic brains, the logicians are, are working at the level of the individual molecules, so to speak. Something like that, yeah. And, and so, the, you know, the fact that it is hard to build you know, libraries of formalized mathematics, for instance, is in large part a testament to the fact that mathematical brains are fairly macroscopic compared to the underlying microstructure. 
Uh, obviously, I don't think they're anywhere near as macroscopic as actual brains are compared to the quantum microstructure of the universe, but it's still something analogous is going on there, I think. Well, no, I mean, we, we've got a sense of that. I mean, actually, my sort of empirical mathematics observations and things, you know, we're, we're talking tens of thousands of, you know, the layers, it's actually pretty interesting. I mean, the machine code, the machine code version of a theorem might be tens of thousands of, of pieces, right? As opposed to 10 to the 100 pieces, you know, in, you know, our, our, us relative to the elementary length might be a factor of 10 to the 100. Whereas mathematics as practiced in the, you know, early 21st century is of the order of 10,000 uh, things relative to the machine code of mathematics. So that's an interesting comparison. So it's 10 to the four versus 10 to the 100. So what does it mean? So that means there should be more quantum mechanical stuff, more, more discretization. I mean, the observation of the experimental consequences of the machine coding of mathematics should be more obvious than the experimental consequences of the elementary length in physics. Right, right. So what is the, what is the experimental consequence. I mean, so the elementary length in physics, we don't yet fully understand, you know, what its consequences are for the physical world for our actual observations. But the question would be, what's the analog of, you know, what is discretization length? How do you see discretization length in mathematics? Well, I, th I think in a sense, the little experiment you just did was kind of, was probing that, right? I mean, if, if you look at, if, okay, let's prove some theorem that we would consider, okay, let's, first thing you have to do is, is select a theorem that is kind of the minimal, minimally non-trivial example of a theorem you might prove in ordinary kind of high level mathematics, if you like, right? So say something like, uh, you know, proof of left identity given the axioms of group theory with right identity, right? That's a slightly non-trivial theorem to prove. Uh, I know find equational proof can prove that in 11 steps. I forget exactly how many critical pair lemmas it needs, but looking at the critical pair lemma count in, in a proof like that, is effectively a way of probing the underlying discretization scale of mathematics, I claim. Right. Sorry, I got distracted for a second here. So you have to repeat that because I I, I can't, I, I, I thought I could understand it even while I was distract, distracted. Um, uh, uh, sorry, could, re repeat that. I, I got the thing about right identity and so on, but what was what was your claim about? So, so all I'm saying is that, that that's the, looking at the critical pair lemma count in, the, in a proof of that kind, is the analog of probing the discretization scale of mathematical space. Why? Why? So, because, so, so if, if we take, so take one of those proofs that, that you know, you could imagine a, at least a, like you say, an undergraduate learning group theory might care about, right? So, so, so something which is involving high, relatively high level concepts. Um, and then what you're doing is you're compiling it to something that's low level and formal, and you're looking at essentially how branchy is the path at that scale. What the critical mm -hmm. pair lemma density is telling you is how branchy is that is that part. So, it, so it's telling you effectively, it's giving you a, 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 a heuristic for branchial extent along that particular proof geodesic. So, okay. that, so it, and, and, and so so then that, what that's in turn telling you is roughly how large is the continuum geometry scale, which is kind of the group theory scale, versus the underlying you know microstructure scale, which is where the critical pair lemma stuff lies. If well, you're saying so. You're saying that the question is the scale of the large scale statement relative to the scale of these little branches, which is kind of the Planck's constant of um, of meta mathematics. Well, yeah, it's, it's it's like if you wanted to understand if you wanted to know the discretization scale of space time, how would you how would you do it? So suppose you had some way. Anytime your causal graph bifurcated, suppose you had some way. You know, you, there were two possible causal edges coming out of a single event. Suppose there was some way you could detect that every time it happened. So then what you would want to ask is given some, you know, macroscopic length, which it, for which there is a continuum geometrical description, you know, along which the Ricci scalar varies by some measurable amount, uh, how many branches are there, right? That would give you essentially some, some well, notion. So each branch is a light cone. Each branch is an elementary light cone. Right, right. So what you're asking is if you want to take you are effectively asking, what is the maximum diffusion, amount of diffusion? So you start from an event and you're asking, it's gonna follow both branches of the light cone. So you're asking, given this event, how many points can it reach by going all these different ways on the light cone? Uh -huh. Versus what? Versus the continuum geometrical distance. Which gives you Okay, so you're saying, 
Well, I'm a little confused by that, but well, the, 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 look. So you you've got a you've got a kind of look. So so you've got the elementary length scale. And then you've got kind of what you might refer to as essentially the discretization cutoff, right? The point beyond which the continuum approximation is no longer valid. Yes. And essentially what you want to know is what's the, you know, in a sense, you want to know the ratio between those two things. Yep. And, and so, so what, what I'm trying to argue is you want to, just like in the space-time case, you would want to know what's the, if I take the minimal space-time distance along which there is a continuum geometry that's defined. So the minimum distance along which, as I say, for instance, the Ricci scalar varies. Mm -hmm. And I want to know along that distance, how many elementary light cones are there, right? How many quarters? Fair enough, are yeah. That tells me the discretization. All I'm proposing is the analog of that for metamathematics. So in metamathematics, with the theorem prover, we actually do have a way of detecting essentially how many you know, elementary light cones are there. It's given by critical pair lemma density. And so what you want to do is take a kind of minimal non-trivial inference in the high level math you know, mathematical language, like in group theory. And, and say, if I compiled that down to the underlying equational logic stuff underneath, uh, how, what, you know, what would the critical pair lemma density be? Okay, so, you're, you're, so one way to put it is this. You've got the automated theorem prover that's doing things at the level of a machine code, so to speak. And you've got yeah. the human doing stuff. So the question is, how much work does the underlying automated theorem prover have to do to do a human, you know, one human thought's worth of stuff? And I suspect the answer there is that on the order of 100. Things that is, if you look at these, these, I mean, again, I've got this metamathematical, empirical metamathematics data, so we probably can answer that question. It's probably the case that for everything that a human would describe as one action, the automated theorem prover is doing a hundred things. That would be my guess. What do you think? Uh, I think it, dep it, dep it depends a lot on the context. That, that there's certainly cases in which that's true. But, but okay, so that's the, so th th that's an interesting measure, right? Is the, is the difference between perceivable mathematics and machine code mathematics. That's the, um, right, perceive. So what's the different, what is the maximum entanglement speed in mathematics? What's the analog of the maximum entanglement speed in mathematics? That's got to give you, because that depends on distance in branchial space. And in fact, this is telling you, this, the, the thing we're just discussing, is a measure of distance, a, a, a human understandable measure of distance in Branchill space, right? Because it's basically telling you distance between mathematical theorems. Mm -hmm. And what it's saying is in terms of, so yeah, so, so basically the measurement is how many pages of paper does it take to go, let, let's say you started at some point, you're going to go two different branches in the branch pair and you end up at, at some distance apart. So you can say how many mathematics paper pages are there for each of these different paths. And so then in a sense, your distance in Branchial space is measured in, in um, so the units are basically, you know, pages of mathematics paper per, so, so we're asking, so the, the, the um, uh, let's see, how would this work? We're trying to translate between um, you know, the, the question is the analog of the speed of light is the, the sort of the distance you go in metamathematical branchial space versus the passage of time. Yeah, so there's, so there's an analogy there. Anyway, the, the, um, um, we've gone longer than we expected to go here, but, but, uh, uh, but this is an interesting topic. Um, well, we, the, do you have any th thoughts about that? The, this, the analog of in maximum entanglement speed for math mathematics? I think this is the unit. I mean, this is, I, I hadn't really realized this before, but the, a, a unit in metamathematics, the human relatable unit in metamathematics is pages of mathematical paper. Okay. I mean, the, um, let's see, a comment from Sol here. Light is human perception versus entanglement speed is proving steps. Um, Not sure. Uh, I think, um, boy, we've got all kinds of interesting comments here on our live stream. Uh, this is iota lambdas. Okay. Oh boy, don't get me started on simple bases for computation. That's where we, that's where this whole, see the thing that caused my computer to blow up, shortly not blow up, but, but 
crash shortly before, actually the computer didn't crash, 157 parallel kernels crashed, but my computer that was controlling them didn't crash. Um, the, uh, um, uh, that has to do with, so, so when we, you know, the original claim of mathematics as empirical science, so to speak, that we are trying to describe, I mean, okay, so, so your basic claim about the, about the view of mathematics from 100 years ago is we've got all these theorems that are true. What is the underlying theory from which these theorems might be built? Actually, the, making that comment makes me understand a little bit better Hilbert's point of view about physics. Because for, you know, for Hilbert, and I really hadn't known this history until very recently. I mean, Hilbert spent 20 years from 1900 to 1920 you know, very much interested in physics, and in particular in this problem that we've also been interested in, which is how does continuum behavior arise from discrete atomic elements? And for him, he probably viewed his, his Hilbert sixth problem, the axiomatization of physics. Boy, I hadn't really internalized this before. I mean, what he probably was thinking of was exactly the same as what he thought he was doing in mathematics. He thought he was doing, he thought that finding the fundamental theory of physics was like finding zomelo frankel, frankel set theory. Right, right. Which is, which is essentially how I view this project at some level. Well, yes, but, but, that, that, but, but that's 100 years later after a lot of different turns made in the intervening period when people thought they were doing something completely different. But, but, in, 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 um, but, but in some sense, well, the reason you say that is because you're thinking that the scientific induction that we're doing is with respect to theoretical physics. Right. Right? So in other words, there's a scientific induction with respect which we haven't yet done because it's hard and we're going to get to it with respect to experimental physics. Where, but there's already such a, such a large you know, corpus of theoretical physics that there's induction to do with respect to theoretical physics first. Mm -hmm. And, but now the question would be, if we now say, so we're trying to find fundamental rules for the universe and we say, we're gonna add this piece. So what's the analogy between adding axioms in mathematics and adding something where we say, this is, see, okay, where this, the place where this started was, my question of what would it mean if we just have the axioms of mathematics wrong? And there are other axioms that are really powerful that we should add, like principle of computational equivalence. What if we just added that as an axiom to mathematics? What would it mean? What would happen? And, uh, you know, because people have been very reticent to add axioms in mathematics for a long time. I mean, I, I don't really understand. How would you view the univalence, you know, univalent axiom, univalent foundations program and the univalence axiom as a, I mean, do you view that as being a, a new direction in adding axioms to mathematics? Or you view that as being something, I mean, it's a different branch from the set theory branch. Yeah, although it, it I mean, univalence is the way, is a canonical way in homotopy type theory of solving the problem we discussed right near the beginning of how do you manage all these different notions of equality, right? You've right. got structural equality, syntactical equality, axiomatic equality, uh, you know, type equality, propositional equality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Univalence is, is, an, is a single axiom you can in principle add to your you know, type theoretic foundations that says, actually, there's a way I can convert between all these different notions of equivalence. I mean, so why was that axiom not needed in mathematics before? Was it glossed over in the meta logic of things? Um, well, people didn't have the... So I think... Homotopy type theory was the first time where people really were forced to confront this problem of multiple equalities in a serious way, because all of a sudden you had this notion of type extensionality that came from ordinary logic. You know, or, you know ordinary logics have, well, ordinary classical logics have propositional extensionality, their type theoretic variants have type extensionality. Um, but, you know, homotopy type theory introduced this other idea of homotopy equivalence between paths, right? And they were, and so, so suddenly you had to, you were confronted with this issue of, well, hang on, we've got these two notions of equivalence relations that seem to be behaving the same way. How do we, how do we deal with this idea? And, you know, univalence was the statement that not only are they 
not only is type equivalence and, and path equivalence, not only are they the same thing, but actually the statement that they are the same thing is itself, is itself essentially a type equivalence story. Um, I mean, that, that's, that's ultimately what univalence says. And so, so in, in, our, in our context, what that's basically telling you is that if you do a, uh, if you have say a, you know, a, a substitution lemma path that results in a proof of equality between two expressions, which is like a standard propositional extensionality type extensionality story in ordinary logic. And you have a critical pair statement of equivalence between two ex expressions because you've got two independent paths from a common point and you kind of draw a line between them. That's like a, that's like a path equivalence of, of you know, two paths in a homotopy space. What the univalence axiom is effectively telling you, or one of its implications, is that that notion of equality that you get from substitution lemmas and the notion of equality you get from critical pair lemmas is the same notion of equality, and which, right. is, a, which is not something you would otherwise have been able to prove just based on the meta logic. Well, right. So what you're saying is the very fact that you can throw critical pair lemmas into the story is a consequence of a univalence kind of assumption. And That's presumably, true. what is the higher order version of a critical pair lemma? So critical pair lemmas are equivalence between proofs. There must be equivalences between equivalences between proofs. Right, right. And, and this is, so, I mean, in part, that bulletin I wrote on the metamathematics stuff several months ago was, was sort of an initial attempt to address that question. Because when you've got, when you introduce the critical pair lemmas, those introduce new paths in your multi-way. So you get, you get some higher, higher order multi-way system with a, with a new set of paths in it that, that's, of which the original set is a, is a strict superset. And then now if you define, so, so when, when, I, when we were talking earlier about, I introduced one set of completion rules, it resolves some set of critical pairs, but it introduces a new set of critical pairs. So now I've got new sets of crit, uh, completion rules I can add. The, the argument is that, then that those new completion rules I'm adding are like the higher order version of those morphisms. Because they are uh, they are equivalences not between paths in the original inference system, but they are equivalences between paths in this new inference system that is already modded out by equivalences between paths in the original inference system. So, so that that's the those are the analog of the higher homotopies. In, in are they in, really? I mean, because that seems like that's a so one thing you say is I've done some completions. Now I can do more. Com now there are more completions for me to do. So are you sure that that's right? That, that, that that's all that goes on. That there's no that there's no kind of uh, meta notion of a of a generalized critical pair of a second order critical pair or something. That it's just critical pairs all the way down. That there's no there's no sense in which you can well, have. I mean, yeah, you you could introduce such a notion, but the, the point I'm making is that if you actualize the critical pairs as if you actualize the critical pair, the, the the actual completions as new rules. Then yes. you don't need this higher order concept because essentially all that's happening is when, when when you would have had these higher order critical pair, you know these higher order completions connecting these paths they 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 become ordinary completions connecting these new paths that you've introduced into the original system right and you keep doing that and eventually you get to the rule yield limit that gives you the infinity groupoid and all those kinds of good things exactly I mean that, that's that's essentially how we think that whole limit works ultimately yeah right but but so. Yeah, but so so then, what it means um, throwing okay. So this question of what are the right axioms for mathematics and what axioms. So so one way to think about it is you've got the high level description of all these theorems that you want to be true, and you're trying to find the right machine code. Actually, Parmenides on our live stream asks, isn't reverse mathematics the project to find the right axioms for meta mathematics? I think. The, I mean, reverse mathematics is the idea of, given certain theorems, what are the minimal set of axioms that you need to prove those theorems? Yes, that is that is surely related. I mean, and, and how does one think about that? That's reverse mathematics is like scientific induction on mathematics. It's like trying to find the underlying laws for mathematics, given certain things that we think are true in mathematics. But I mean, in um, let's think, is I'm still fighting this question of adding principle of computational equivalence. So adding univalence, univalence comes out of left field. It's, it's not related. It's not part of ZFC. What is the relationship between univalence and ZFC? Well, ZFC doesn't have a notion of homotopy equivalence in any fundamental sense. 
Um, you could, I mean, of course, you can construct a model of ZFC, you know, based on something like homotopy type theory, in which there is such a notion, in which case you'd get univalence in that, just as you would in, in ordinary homotopy type theory. Um, you, you know, what you need, what you would need for something like the univalence axiom to hold in ZFC, which would be to have ZFC, you know, be equipped with two different notions of extensionality. But right. ZFC only has one axiom of extensionality. So you don't, you know, in a sense, you don't, you're not. Well, so, so the basic point is you don't need univalence because the language of ZFC does not have things in it for which univalence would be relevant. Right, right. If you had two axioms, if univalence had, sorry, if, uh, if ZFC had two axioms of extensionality rather than one, then you might need something like the univalence axiom. Well, so you could make the same argument between piano arithmetic and ZFC. You could say, you know, piano arithmetic doesn't talk about sets, so you don't need all the axioms of, of set theory. But yet, there is a different sense in which there's a hierarchy. Okay, so here's a question. Are there things that you can prove in homotopy type theory? Okay, what is the hierarchy? So there are, if I just ask for a halting problem for a Turing machine, there's a certain level of halting problem for Turing machines that I can prove in piano arithmetic. There's another one I can prove in set theory. Where does, where does homotopy type theory lie on that hierarchy? Well, so that there are, um... I believe it, it, well, homotopy type theory definitely lies further up in the hierarchy than ZFC. Uh, because it, I, I know that in order to get a model of homotopy type theory in ZFC, you need to add some collection of inaccessible cardinals. Oh, uh, or, okay. or you have to do a weird thing with natural models. But so, so homotopy type theory effectively allows you to define inaccessible cardinals that otherwise would not be defined. Wow, well. so homotopy type theory lets you essentially prove halting of Turing machines that cannot be proved in set theory. That that would be the claim. Yes, I, I I must. I don't understand how that works, uh, but I, I know that that's that's something that is claimed. But you see, coming back to this original issue, so given you know, given the goal of, I want to prove the halting of certain Turing machines. I want to prove the 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 existence of uh, solutions to certain Diophantine equations, or more to the point, I want to prove the non-existence of solutions to Diophantine equations. I want to prove that. Um, yeah. See, here's the, here's the confusion, okay? So I have a very practical problem, which is, you know, I keep on coming back to my computers crashing, okay? Because they are looking for a halting, they are trying to solve a halting problem, basically. And the fact that they crashed is an interesting sign that they might have actually found something that I completely didn't expect. Um, because, uh, uh, which is sort of inevitable in, in trying to solve these computational problems, because that's the whole idea of computational irreducibility is that, you know, but in any case, my question is, I'm, I'm very confused because there are these things that appear to always halt, yet I'm pretty sure they're universal. And could I make the inference, if I just say, I'm going to add principle of computational equivalence as an axiom, does that then provide a proof that the thing will ultimately have a non-halting example? And if that's the case, you know, how would things go wrong? Things would go wrong if that somehow provides inconsistency, if that somehow introduces an inconsistency. Um, right. right. Um, you know, I, I, I agree. I'm, I'm fascinated by this question of how you would formalize PCE in something like set theory. Um, right. My initial intuition is to go with essentially what's already been done in descriptive set theory that I, okay. It has always, it has always puzzled me the fact that there seems to be this, as far as I can tell, a deep structural relationship between the Borel hierarchy in descriptive set theory and the arithmetical hierarchy in computability theory, to the point where I wouldn't be surprised if someone, if it's possible to, or if someone already has, proved that there's a way to translate problems from one to the what other. What is this Borel hierarchy thing? I don't, I don't know. Okay, what it is. So, so the so the idea. Okay, so so descriptive set theory is is a way of, um, like with you know descriptive. Descriptive complexity in you know computer in in uh, theoretical computer science is all about talking about you know how do I uh, how do I talk about how well behaved an object is in terms of like the algorithmic complexity of its description or something. Uh, descriptive set theory is kind of the set theoretic analog of that. We talk about you know if you're looking at uh, subsets of a Polish space or something, you want to characterize how well behaved that subset is by looking at essentially how how easy is is it, is it to describe and. The way you formalize that is you say, okay, I've got, I've got, uh, I've got a bunch of Borel sets. I've got a class of the Borel sets over some topological space. 
And then there are certain operations I can do to those Borel sets, right? I can take their complements, I can take their union, I can take their intersection and so on. And then the Borel hierarchy is basically asking how many times do I have to apply the operations of countable union and complementation in order to obtain a set given some initial class of open sets. So it's, it's, it's a kind of topological analog of a descriptive complexity. And you know, of course, the arithmetical hierarchy is essentially saying, how many times do I have to quantify over something or which quantifiers do I have to right. use? Those have to be the same. They have yeah. to be the same. There has to be, look, complementation, I mean, you know, there exists and for all are, you know, directly analogous to union intersection in some sense. Right. And it has to be, there has to be a correspondence between those. Right. Um, so so in, in which case, it, given that, it seems that actually including, essentially introducing a computability, you know, introducing computability or even complexity theoretic axioms into set theory via this sort of Borel hierarchy shouldn't be particularly difficult. I don't know in detail how you would do it. Well, except it's a metamathematical statement about set theory, because basically set theory does not usually talk about its description, right? It, it doesn't, when you make a, an axiom of, or a theorem in set theory, it is not discussing the structure. It is not, it, it's like, you know, it's like what Gödel did for piano arithmetic. It's not, what is the analog of Gödel numbering for set theory? Obviously one can make such a thing, right? In other words, right. where but then you're not adding PCE as an axiom to set theory, you're adding PCE as an axiom to the meta logic within which set theory is the object language. Possibly, but but let's let's come back to that for a second. But first, first let me understand this. I mean, so what is the analog? Presumably, just like you can do girdle numbering, where you take numbers which are things of piano arithmetic and you describe proofs in piano arithmetic using numbers. Presumably, and I'm sure people have done this, you can describe proofs in set theory in terms of sets. Is that a true statement? Well, yeah, uh, it's, it's much, if it, you, you know, you don't need anything as clever as Gödel numbering, right? I mean, you, you, you can treat, you know, sets can easily encode ordered tuples and a proof is an ordered tuple of symbols. So it's- Okay, kind of, fine. So sets uh, can be sets, sets can be proofs. And, and so, actually, here's a very naive question that I should know the immediate answer to. But is, is Gödel's theorem much easier to prove in set theory as a result of that? What is the proof of Gödel's theorem in set theory? Well, most, the, the only, the closest thing to a proof of Gödel of the first incompleteness theorem in set theory that I've seen is the proof that basically says we can construct the piano integers in, in ZFC QED. Okay, but you could also imagine proving, you know, statements like, you know, turning this statement is, is unprovable into a statement of set theory. Yeah, right. Which, which I mean, as exactly as you say, would be much easier to do in set theory than in piano arithmetic. Because I mean, the 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 only okay, uh, no, that's that's not. I was going to say the only clever thing in the incompleteness theorem proof is the Gödel numbering, which is not quite true. But the the in some sense the 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 most technically non-trivial thing is the realization that you can encode, you know, statements about provability as statements about, you know, domains of functions over internet. Right. And the, and the reason that's non-trivial is because it's what made us software, basically. I mean, it's the idea of software that you can, that you can encode something, you know, completely different in terms of this low-level machine code. I mean, that was, that was a big idea. Um, not very clear in that instantiation, but but so the analogous thing in set theory is presumably much easier because it's a much higher level yeah. language. Right, right. And so, so, so even the really simple-minded, naive encoding I just gave would already be simpler than the piano arithmetic encoding because, you know, the piano arithmetic encoding requires knowing about prime factorization and it requires knowing effectively how you translate between the symbolic alphabet and the, and the integers and so on. Whereas if you just treat each proof as being an ordered tuple of symbols from some set of you know, some finite symbolic set of, 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 of well, some, some finite alphabet of symbols, um, then the encoding between the set and the proof is much more direct. Uh, so already the proof is simpler. And what about homotopy type theory? It must be even easier. Uh, how would that work? But I think it's a question of types being universal somehow, that you can describe any, you can describe any type statement in terms of types and so on. Yeah. Uh, Yes, I, my intuition for type theory is much worse than my intuition for set theory. So I don't know offhand how you do that, but yeah. Right, but, but so, okay, but so then what we've got here is a hierarchy where you go from piano arithmetic to set theory to, to univalence axioms, homotopy type theory and so on. So now the question is, what would it look like if we had another theory whose 
fundamental thing was computational and where it assumed the principle of computational equivalence. Right? I mean, the computational principle of computational equivalence is much less wacky than things like the continuum hypothesis in the sense of being like, why should this be true type thing? Um, well, that right. one isn't. I mean, well, Actually, I, that one isn't particularly wacky, but there are other pieces of set theory, which I probably don't even remember, of the axioms of set theory, which is why should this be true kind of thing. Um, well, I think axiom of uncountable choice is my, is my go-to example of that. What does that say? So, you know, axiom of choice is the, you know, is the, is the thing that says if, if I have a collection of sets that are all non-empty and I take one element of each set, and I use that to assemble a new set, then the new set I assemble has to be non-empty. And when, you're, when your collection is finite, that's obviously true. When it's countable, it seems reasonable. But if it's an uncountable collection of sets, it's, it's, you, you, know, you reach this question of what, 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 what the hell does it mean to construct a choice function over an un uncountable collection of sets? And that's why essentially the axiom of uncountable choice uh, has this slightly you know, philosophically controversial status in the foundations of mathematics, because it's kind of, it's not at all clear that it's really true. Right, whatever really true means. I mean, because really true, you know, might be relative to our universe, for example. Yeah. Well, actually, I mean, this, this um, you, you may have already realized this long ago, but, but I mean, one of, the, one of the nice things, I, one of the nice philosophical consequences of this project, in my opinion, is that it completely obliterates this distinction between formalism and Platonism, which I, I know in NKS, you had already sort of emphasized that you could get rid of this distinction. But I think the physics project gets rid of it at an even more fundamental level, because it's saying, you know, the distinct, the statement that they are distinct is somehow the statement that if mathematical statements are, uh, you know, are just kind of collections of meaningless symbols on, on, you know, produced by meaningless symbolic transformations, then they can't, correspond to anything in objective reality. But if what we're determining is that all physical objects are ultimately the consequence of meaningless symbolic transformations, you're led to this very nice conclusion that mathematical objects must possess at least the same level of reality as any physical object. Um, yes, kind of yes, no, no, I, I agree. I think that the, you know, the one piece of that that we don't understand is the actualization of the universe. Right. I mean, we understand descriptively that that's correct, but what actualizes the universe, as opposed to just two plus two equals four, that's nice, but that's just a fact. What is the difference between that and the actuality of time happening in the universe? I mean, in other words, the- But that's, that's where your ontological version of Gödel's incompleteness theorems comes in, right? Because I know, I know, I know, but which we haven't yet figured out. Maybe we, maybe because we're on a roll here, maybe we can figure that out. I mean, the, the, you know, that, that, so that's a question. Actually, that's interesting. Okay. This is a motivation for why we want to generalize axiom systems. Okay. Because if you ask the question from within, yeah, yeah. Because the, the point is, if we have an axiom system that essentially is the universe is so, so this, okay. To, to roll back a bit, the question is, uh, you know, can we prove what is the status of the statement the universe exists? Can we prove that the universe has to exist? Or is it the case, as I suspect, that for entities within the universe, it is fundamentally unprovable and undecidable whether the universe exists? So in other words, that if you're if you're within the universe for the same reasons as you know the second incompleteness theorem, you can't show the consistency of, of arithmetic from within arithmetic. What is the precise analog of that for for a universe? And see, the problem is when we say, okay, so question is, somebody could ask the question. You know, is our universe just like a Turing machine all the way down? Answer, yes, at some level. Somebody might also ask the question, is our universe like piano arithmetic all the way down? Well, in some sense, yes, but relative to this whole interpretability, you know, building models and the thing that aren't really, uh, but, but in some sense, it's, it's less like piano arithmetic all the way down than it's like a Turing machine all the way down. And the question is what, but, what, but why? Why do you say that? Because the use of piano arithmetic, well, this is the question, is, is if we're trying to prove theorems about the universe, because normally in the universe, we're just trying to figure out what is the universe going to do, 
right? And Turing machines don't come equipped with theorem proving apparatus. Um, the, uh, I mean, you know, Peon arithmetic comes equipped with sort of a theorem proving apparatus. It does not come equipped with an evolution apparatus. Turing machines come equipped with an evolution apparatus, but not with a theorem proving apparatus. Yeah, but that's, I don't know. That, that, that seems to be making a distinction where I'm not sure any exists, right? I mean, Possibly, that's right. But I mean, it may also be a question of the observers as represented. Anyway, we're, 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 we're being, it's being pointed out that we reached the two hour mark and we all have lots of other things to do. But, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, we didn't, we didn't solve the question. So, I, I mean, coming back to this question, can we add principle of computational equivalence? Is there a new axiom system? It's the 100th anniversary of the Franco set theory, more or less. Um, you know, surely after a hundred years, well, maybe we need to continue the trend. After a hundred years, you know, we're trying to add a new, essentially, foundation for physics. Maybe we need to do the same thing for mathematics. Um, and maybe they're actually closely related. Um, I mean, in the sense that it's it's uh, it is interesting that a hundred years ago is when you know when general relativity and quantum mechanics got set, you know, got laid down, so to speak, which happens to be the same kind of time when the axiomatic framework of mathematics got laid down. That's interesting. I, I wonder whether that's coincidental. I don't think that it is. And so, somehow David Hilbert managed to be central to a large fraction of that stuff. Well, yes. I mean, I, I think, but, but, but the question is, you know, the foundations of mathematics as they exist, what, I mean, we've thought about two different ways in which the foundations could be changed. One is, adding kind of the computational step to things like category theory and probably to set theory. I don't even know what it looks like. I mean, this description idea of yours is a way to potentially, you know, if you associate computational cost to each of those steps, then you are beginning to sort of introduce sort of computation into set theory. Yeah, I mean, so, so what, what I was actually going to propose was that, so, okay, in ordinary computability, you know, in ordinary theoretical computer science, the way you basically go from computability theory to computational complexity theory, or one way you can do it, is you're thinking about, I take the arithmetical hierarchy, and I go to the polynomial hierarchy, right? So, so in which case, I'm not right. just describing, uh, you know, computability, I, I, I'm actually looking at associating, as you say, a computational cost with, with each of these operations. So if we if we take, as I, as, as I think we both agree, what is this obvious translation of the Borel hierarchy is really the arithmetical hierarchy, but for set theory, the, qu the question is, what's the polynomial hierarchy like? And at least at a qualitative level, I think I know what it would look like. It would be rather than just treating, uh, you know, set complement, set union, uh, you know, set, uh, et cetera, as being just kind of atomic operations, you would say that they somehow depend on things like the measure of the set or the cardinality of the set or something like that. The, and the, 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 you know, for each element or for each unit of measure or something, there's some, some unit of computational cost. And that would let you construct a finer grained version of the Borel hierarchy that would be kind of complexity theoretic. But I don't think that's been done, at least as far as I'm well, aware. Well, in fact, what that would do for you, which might be very interesting, is traditional computational complexity theory all works in the context of sort of integer computation. And in fact, all of computation theory works in the context of integer computation. To do the analogous thing, there's never been a robust version of kind of non of continuous computation. It's never been robust. It's always like you've got one version of it, you've got another version of it. There's no kind of church Turing thesis for continuous computation. And so to be able to you know, do something like a computational complexity theory for set theory might give you a way into that. All right, we've, we've got more to discuss for another time. Um, and uh, uh, all right, boy, I, I, you know, yeah, there's a lot of interesting things here. Okay, we should probably wrap it up. Um, and thank you to folks on our live stream for um, uh, all kinds of interesting input here. And um, uh, um, actually, I'm just, um, um, oh, I, I have to comment on one comment here from David, uh, commenting that Gödel dis disproved Hilbert's idea of axiomatic mathematics and um, uh, incompleteness would naturally extend to physics theories. Yes, that's absolutely correct. And in fact, the, the, the thing that I think is beautiful is many of Hilbert's problems have fallen to incompleteness and undecidability. 
the one, one that we don't know about, haven't known about yet is the sixth problem, the axiomatization of physics. But one of the consequences of our project will be that that one too will be that essentially the richness of the universe is a consequence of the fact that Hilbert also didn't know about Gödel's theorem in formulating the sixth problem, as well as all the other ones. I think I've got the sixth right. I, I got to know that. If we're, if we're working on this whole program, we better know which Hilbert problem it's solving. We better check that. Is that right? Yeah, no. It's it's the sixth, yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, I think actually in his in his original presentation, I think he, I think he said physics and and beyond. Or so. I, I think he didn't stop at physics. He wants to axiomatize everything. Yeah, he wanted to axiomatize economics and everything. Right. Don't get me started on that. That's another one of these discussions which we should have about um, the analogy between computational irreducibility and value in economics. But I I the, that's uh, for another day. Um, and perhaps with other folk, if we can, if we can find an economist who's bold enough to be part of this conversation, we can um, uh, we can do that too. Um, all right. Well, anyway, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, see you all another time.